Sunday, and it's time for church. We are so glad that you came to the City Church this morning. We hope that this can be a place where you can connect, grow, and serve. Connect with God and the City family through worship and fellowship. Grow in your understanding of God and who you are. And serve the community of Northwest Arkansas. Today is Sunday, and it's time for church. Let's get started. Hey Amen. I'm ready to get started. Uh, we have a really good service plan today. There's a bunch of fun stuff we're going to do today. We've got more worship coming up. KC's going to be preaching today on Psalm chapter 121 as we're going to be going through uh, the Psalms of Ascent. And uh, I'm really excited to be learning about these Psalms. I never really studied the, the Psalms of Ascent much, very, very much before, but I'm excited to get into this, week two of this. There'll be an opportunity for prayer and for communion later on, just right over here. Uh, KC will be over there later in the service. You can meet him over there. As always, communion is available every week on the table over there. You can just take it uh, if you feel led to. There'll be an opportunity for giving later. Also tonight, there's city groups as we, uh, you know, take the, the afternoon off. We get together in uh, Libby's house tonight, and we're going to be talking about this morning's message and eating and just fellowshipping together. Uh, it's a really good time, and, uh, and there's a lot of good things going on at the church this week. In fact, uh, after city groups tonight. We have uh, the women's, every month we do like a men's or women's night out. And this month we're gonna, the women are going to be decorating the church. Um, but it's not going to be like, hey, women come and work. It's, <laughs> we're going to try to make it a fun thing. Libby's been working on uh, creating a fun atmosphere. I think they're going to turn a movie on and have hot chocolate and refreshments and stuff. And then uh, decorate the foyer and a couple of areas of the church for uh, City Family Christmas, which is coming up really fast. We're, we've been working on it. We had the uh, last week when we filmed the kids part of it and getting ready for, to, for City Family Christmas. Um, later this month on the 25th, the, it's the 25th is the, uh, it's the Saturday after Thanksgiving, uh, we're going to be taking our food truck uh, down to uh, Emma downtown and uh, serving hot cider out of our truck uh, to, to people at Christmas on the Creek. The city does a great job, a Christmas festival, to kind of kick off the Christmas season, and there's a parade, and there's a whole, a whole bunch of stuff that they're doing down there. Uh, I was looking at what actually is happening. There's like five or six events that are all happening at once in the same area, so it's a big deal. There'll be thousands of people down there, and uh, we're going to take our food truck down there and uh, serve just like we did last month uh, out of it. Uh, we had a great reception last time. We, we we served like nine gallons of hot chocolate in like an hour. It was amazing how fast. We basically just kept the spigot going and just kept putting cups into there and handing them out. It was just uh, amazing how fast it, it was served. But uh, we're doing that. So so volunteer to help us with that. Uh, it's the 25th. We have a great time. Every time we drag that trailer out, just seeing people's face light up as we give them something for free. And uh, we serve the community. People are like, why are you doing this? And uh, it's a good time. So join us the 25th for that. And then I'm super excited to announce uh, our first youth event, uh, City Youth, as uh, we're getting ready to start. We're going to start off, take it easy, you know, we're not going to do a full-fledged youth service and, and all that with just uh, the kids we have, but uh, we are going to start small and grow it into that eventually. And so our first uh, thing is we're going to do is starting our youth ministry here is called First Fridays. And every first Friday of the month, we're going to get together. Uh, with, the, with the teenagers and take them out to do something fun together or have something fun here. And the first one is we're going to be going to uh, the Fayetteville Square uh, where they have the lights and stuff. And so we'll be going down there and uh, hanging out and I think we're going to go out to eat with them and stuff. So anyway, if you want to get involved in youth ministry, also talk to me about that. Uh, there's lots of opportunities to get invo involved and uh, to serve that way. I'm excited about it. I was a youth pastor for 10 years. It's in my heart. It's what initially got me into the ministry because I, I love teenagers, and so I'm really excited about this extremely important step in our church as we go towards that. And finally, before we get into worship, and we will get into worship eventually, I wanted to uh, recognize our veterans this weekend as they took the whole weekend. I like how we do this now. Take the whole weekend to honor our veterans. And uh, me and Kara were talking this weekend about it, and uh, she had a letter that uh, her grandma wrote to her, her grandpa during the war, and, and she wrote this down. I'm going to read just a few little pieces of it, just to kind of uh, give you some context of where I'm coming from. Uh, this is her grandma writing to her grandpa. I said, he, he used to come home. This is actually a poem. 
that she wrote. He used to come home in the afternoon and catch, uh, catch me to him and kiss me too and say, how did you get on today? That's how they talked. How did you get on today? I, I never said that to my wife. How did you get on today? And I'd reply, okay, but lonely without you. And she writes more. It's kind of cute. And, uh, and then it says here, and then, the, and then there came the draft and he went too. And now he's gone and days are alone and blue. Sometimes I feel as if I can't go on, but God will help me be a soldier too. And I thought that was really neat how she wrote that. It's, uh, the reason I wanted to read a little bit of this is because this letter represents the thousands, the hundreds the, uh, of texts, emails, letters that, that are written to our soldiers every day. All, all across the world, there's these, these types of notes being written. And uh, it's just a good reminder of how much our soldiers give up. Uh, brave men and women going across the world to defend our freedom, defend our rights, and uh, I just think this morning it'd be, it'd be good of us to just remember how much they sacrificed, how much they are sacrificing, so that we can join together and worship God. I mean, we take this for granted, this, these moments we get together here to worship God, but it's something we shouldn't take for granted because not everybody can do this. So if you are a veteran, uh, if, you, if you've served any time at all in, in the, our military, would you mind standing up this morning so we can honor you? Thank you. Would you just give them a round of applause this morning? Thank you so much for your sacrifice and for your your bravery as you serve our country. Uh, There's really not much I can say that uh, would do honor and justice to to your service. But anyhow, we're going to get on in service today, and uh, I think we should do so by by praying. Uh, So would would you mind just joining me in prayer this morning as we head into Lord, we are so blessed to be here this morning. We are so blessed to come and to gather uh, to worship you, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that this morning as we continue our service, that the rest of it is dedicated to you, Lord, dedicated to honoring your glory, your wisdom, your majesty, your power, Father. We're so blessed, Lord. We're so blessed as as, uh, followers, Lord. We thank you, Lord, and uh, as we... As we go on in service, Lord, I pray that your spirit would hover over us, Lord, as we are in communion with you, Lord. We love you. Amen. Stay in worship this morning. Broken hearts declare His praise. But who can stop the Lord Almighty? And our God is a lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring in power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before Him. And our God is a lamb. For the sins of the world, His blood breaks the change. Every knee will bow before the Lion in the land. Oh, every knee will bow before Him. Sins of the world, his blood breaks the chains. 
Chase me down 
rushing over me, rushing in to make me hear. Your love is dear, like a hurricane. I can't escape, tear it through the atmosphere. So thankful for his love that's unconditional and never failing. At this time, I want to just invite anyone who has a need, we just want to be able to pray with you. If you need a healing in your body, healing in a relationship, healing at your job, absolutely any need, God is ready to meet you right where you are. All you have to do is just put your faith in him, your trust in him, and he's right there. He will come meet you right where you are. We also have a moment uh, this time available for communion. It's on the table on this wall to the left. This morning we're going to sing a new song. It's called Healing Is Here. And this song has really ministered to me. This morning I just pray that as we sing this, as we begin to learn this song together, that it's the words, the message can be declared over our lives that healing is here. Where the presence of the Lord is, there is healing and there is freedom. It is his will for our lives to be healed. Let's worship this morning.
in the Lord I reach my hands to the heavens lift my eyes where my help comes from look to you have to bow down cause there is power in the name of Jesus there is power in the name of Jesus there is power 
in the name of Jesus to break every chain break every chain break every chain one more time there is power in the name of Jesus there is power in the name of Jesus there is power in the name of Jesus to break every chain break every chain break every chain to break to break every chain 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 finally lay your eyes on the mountain, something begins to stir within your soul. This is probably why the Bible mentions mountains and hills over 500 times. God created the mountains, and several times in Scripture, He chose the mountain as the place to speak to us. Ma'arat is where God chose to place Noah back on dry land after the flood. On Mount Sinai, God met with Moses and gave us His Ten Commandments. Mount Zion is where the Temple of Solomon is placed and where Israel would celebrate the faithfulness of God three times a year. It was on Mount Carmel that Elijah called down fire from heaven to display the reality of the power of God. On Mount Tabor, Jesus was overwhelmed with the Spirit and experienced the transfiguration where Jesus appears with Moses and Elijah who themselves encountered God on the mountaintop in the Old Testament. The transfiguration is the moment when Jesus is seen as the fulfillment of the law delivered by Moses and the prophets, Elijah being the obvious representative. It just makes sense that God chose Golgotha as the hillside where Jesus would set the world free by offering his body as a living sacrifice. Mountains mean something. They are beautiful. They represent a creative, powerful, and genius. They are the place that God has spoken to us numerous times, and they are a symbol of His faithfulness. So when this world is so quick to show you the valley, just remember that the deeper the valley, the more the valley walls appear to be mountaintops, and mountaintops represent victory. So never take your eyes off the prize, the mountain. He has been there since the beginning. He will always be there. He is always with us. So look to the mountains. Thank you. 
Who would leave his throne in heaven and step down to the earth? Choose an ordinary woman to the Son of God give birth. Who would take the sinner's cross, climb a hill and die for me, carve my name into his hands? Only Jesus Christ, my King. Only Jesus Christ, my King. Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords. Introduction that's as spot on as that right there. If you can't, you can't remember a single word I said. If you listen to that song, you pull that up, you read it, you, you pray it, you sing it, you're gonna see what we're talking about here today. We look to the mountains because that's where our promises are. God made us promises there, and as pilgrims, as his children, we're promised things, and God shows us so many times those promises from the mountaintop. I want, to, I want to open this up in prayer. We're going to go straight into the sermon today. Father, we're thankful for your promises. We're going to try to communicate that here this morning, God. And I pray that these people here in this, in this service, in my own heart, that we would all latch on to the truth, God, that though we are pilgrims in this earth and we are traveling along, that you've not left us without hope. And that you've given us a destination and you've given us a promise to help us get to that destination, Father. None of those things are our, doing, our own doing. They're all yours. And that we can lean on you to get us to where you have purposed for us to go and the strength that you give us to get there. Put these things in their hearts and their minds here today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Y'all can be seated. Amen. Amen. 
Well, I hope you all are doing well this morning. You tell me if I'm too loud. I get loud and I get excited. So, always excited about the Word of God. We are in the Songs of Ascent. Now, I love the Songs of Ascent, and I will be perfectly honest. Uh, Chris, whenever he and I were talking about what the next sermon series was going to look like, uh, these psalms have always been on my heart, and I love the picture behind them. So whenever he asked me, it was really it was my joy to get to suggest them, and I'm just really glad he, he picked up on I'm, gl- I'm glad that he liked the idea. It, these psalms are a beautiful picture of the Christian walk and the Christian life. We're, gonna, we're about to read the scripture here, and we'll move into these, but I want to give a little bit of a background, and Chris did a great job of setting us up for all the psalms that we're going to be moving into, and this will take many weeks to, to cover through a lot of these, and you know, we may have to break for a moment for the holidays, I don't know what that's going to look like, but we are, we're going to cover these psalms, and he was right in saying that these psalms are, are like a hymn book for Israel as they go up to Jerusalem three times a year. Now, there's a number of reasons why these psalms could have been written. And, I, and I'm going to cover the context here with you. One reason is that there were 15 steps leading up to Jerusalem, and there are 15 of these. And, and it seems like, okay, maybe they stood on each step and they said one of these psalms. Some, someone has said that before. Uh, there are a few people who do believe that. That's not what the commonly held belief about these psalms is. Another idea behind these psalms is that whenever Israel was led into captivity in Babylon, that in order to get back home, they had this hymnal, they had this songbook that they would remind themselves about the promises of God. Now, while it's true they use Scripture for that, I don't believe that's the real purpose for these 15 psalms we're going through. See, Israel was commanded that three times a year, for three separate festivals, they were to go up to Jerusalem. They were to ascend through the wilderness and through the, the, the desert part of, of Israel and go up to the top of this mountain, Mount Zion, and they were going to go to Jerusalem for three feasts, in particular. Three times a year, for very specific reasons, God wants them to make a a migration, a pilgrimage, right? A pilgrimage to Jerusalem. These three feasts were Passover, Pentecost, and there was a feast called Tabernacles or Booths. And we're just going to real quickly cover these because I want you to really understand where we're going with this. The Feast of Pentecost, and this uh, this was a feast that was celebrated at the end time of the harvest, okay? The Feast of Pentecost was one where you get to come together at the very end of the harvest, you get to celebrate what God has provided for you. Uh, as they go through the fields and they're preparing to go up to Jerusalem and they're finishing up their harvest, the interesting thing about Pentecost is that they left the four corners of the field open. So to anyone that was poor and they couldn't afford to get anything to eat, they could come by and glean from what was left over out there in the field. You see in the, the New Testament, at the Festival of Pentecost, the Feast of Pentecost, where the New Testament church is there and the Holy Spirit is poured out on the, on the Feast of Pentecost. Now, it's interesting, I think, that it happens there. And the reason for that is because it was the end of Christ's work. He had accomplished all that needed to be accomplished for us, and at that moment, the Holy Spirit was poured out. And guess what? We get to go into all the world and take the gospel to every person, rich and poor, just like that harvest was provided for every person, rich or poor. So whenever they thought about Pentecost and they're going up to Jerusalem, they were thinking about the provision of God. They had the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Booths, and what this was. This was a feast that, that made them remember and it signified their time of wondering whenever they were, uh, after they left Egypt and they were coming into the Promised Land. You remember they were out there for 40 years and, and many, the, an entire generation died because they weren't faithful to God. But they celebrated this time by going up to Jerusalem once a year. And they would, for eight days, set up these thatch-looking booths and, and huts and kind of tents made out of the scrap that was laying around. And they'd lay under these things for eight days. And they would do that to remember that they had once wandered from God and to remind them not to do it again, but to remember God's faithfulness when they were in that wilderness for the generation who was being raised up. And then you had Passover, the third feast they went up to Jerusalem for. Passover, of course, we're all very familiar with Passover. Christ had Passover. And we can remember whenever in Egypt, Israel was still in Egypt, that the final plague was the angel of death coming through and taking the firstborn child. But they would pass over every house that had the blood of the lamb over the doorpost. They celebrated that feast to remember the salvation of God. Three times a year, Israel celebrated the faithfulness of God, the provision of God, and the salvation of God. Three times a year. And as they moved towards Jerusalem, they looked to the hills that were in front of them as a clear indicator of where they were going. 
I want to cover with you today the fact that just as Israel was on a pilgrimage three times a year, traveling from their own homes, going through strange neighborhoods and valleys and wildernesses in order to get to Jerusalem, just as they were on a pilgrimage, this morning you and I, we're on a pilgrimage. We're on a journey. We're, we are covering a great distance to head towards the promises of God. Our own salvation, God's own provision, God's own faithfulness. We're going towards God and we're trusting in the promises He's given to us. I want to, I want to talk here that like Israel in a strange land, we're pilgrims moving towards His promises and that the people in the Old Testament recognize us as well. They recognize that as we serve God and we love Him, that we are not just moving. They didn't say, here I am as Israel. I'm not just going to Jerusalem because God's commanded me to. But in their hearts, they knew that every day they were drawing nearer to God. And that was their journey. And it's Hebrews chapter 11, verses 13 through 16 that tells us that. They said, all these died in faith without receiving the promises. But having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance, and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth, for those who would say such things make it clear that they are seeking a country not their own. And indeed, if they had been thinking of that country from which they went out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Here's our verse today. And this is Psalms 121, 1 through 8. It says, I will lift up my eyes to the mountains. From where shall my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to slip. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun will not smite you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will protect you from all evil. He will keep your soul. The Lord will guard your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forever. I want to show you today in this psalm that we are pilgrims first, and we have to remember the promises of God as we move towards those promises. I want to show you how God is our helper, our keeper, and our protector as we walk, walk along the road that he's given to us. This verse, verses 1 through 2, I'll lift my eyes to the mountains. From where shall my help come? It's interesting to me, as, as we look at as the structure of the land that's laid out in Israel, and you look up to the mountains, there are several hills that surround Jerusalem. Two in particular, and you, and you got to hear a great explanation of many of them, two in particular really stand out for the Jew. As they're looking at their home, as they're looking at Jerusalem that they're moving towards, one mount that stood out was Mount Moriah. Now, Mount Moriah was where Abraham took Isaac to sacrifice him under God's command. But God provided a ram in the bushes. So whenever they looked at that mountain and they lifted up their eyes to the mountain, they saw and they remembered how God had made a provision for Abraham, so Isaac wouldn't lose his life. And God kept his promises to Abraham. Regardless of his age, God kept his promises. They'd look up and they'd see Mount Zion. And Mount Zion was the mountain where the temple rested. And these were the, the blessings of God were flowing through the temple. That was his presence on earth was in that place. And just as he promised his presence would be in the temple on Mount Zion, he promised that he would go with his people and be with them and make them his people by being in their presence. Now for us, as we look at these mountains, we can understand that these are beautiful symbols of what happened in the past, but if we read over our Old Testament too much, and if we, we just skim over it, we don't understand that as this pilgrim is moving towards Jerusalem, that's our life as well. And as we look towards the promises of God, because of the things God has done in the past, we can remember that God's provision and God's salvation and His promise to walk with us every day are still waiting for us. Three times a year they went up to the temple. Three times a year they went up to Jerusalem. And every single time they saw those mountains out in the distance. And every time it preached a sermon to them. Those sermons constantly were preached. As beautiful as the mountains were, as amazing as they were, they saw them and they weren't just staring at the beautiful mountains. They were staring at the promises of God. You and I in our life, we have circumstances. We have things that we go through that we, that we say, hey, this is the promise of of God in action. Surely, surely this is God is about to move. He's about to do something. And then maybe trouble hits. 
We're trying our best to walk a path. We're trying our best to follow God on this earth. We're on our pilgrimage. And we read in the Bible, it says, you know, we need to do the right thing. We need to do what the Bible says. We need to go to church. We need to live our lives according to the Word of God. And as we're doing those things, we look and we say, surely God is going to provide for, surely He's going to take care of me. And then trouble comes. That's what this this psalmist was going through. He said, "I'm, I'm on my way to Jerusalem. I'm going up to obey God. God told me to go to Jerusalem. Here I am going to Jerusalem, and now he's in distress. And he says, where will my help come from? I lift my eyes up to the hills. Where does my help come from? And he says, my help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. You see, the psalmist who wrote the psalm, he looked past the hills and he looked towards the promise. You and I can get our eyes fixated so much on our destination that we forget about what God is currently doing in our heart. We think, well, here's, here's my, I'm going from point A, going to point A to point B. This is my point B that I'm heading towards, and, and this is God's promise for my life. I've said it. I wrote it down. I wrote it down. This is what I want. I've prayed about it my whole life. I don't, I don't know who, who uh, this, this feels like something I need to emphasize today. Somebody's got something in their life that they, that they have just really, man, this is my whole life revolves around this one thing. You need to remember God in the process walking with you, making you his people as you go. The promise isn't just the destination that you decide. The promise is the promise of home. The promise is the promise of God himself. Those are the promises we can rely on. Not just on what we want, not just the outcome we want, but looking towards what God has actually promised us in his word. We're foreigners and strangers and aliens here in this world, and Satan would like nothing better than to change you and I as we walk on this pilgrim path. You know, I, I was thinking about this, and, and as you're a pilgrim and you're in Israel and you're moving towards the mountain there in Jerusalem, you walk through strange neighborhoods. And as you're walking through strange neighborhoods and you look around, you see the people who are living differently than you do, right? As you're moving through Jerusalem, you see people who live in different neighborhoods and, and they, they seem all different than you, right? As you move through this world, you're going to look around you and you're going to see people in this world that should be looking a whole lot different than you or I. We need to be children of God on this pilgrimage. We need to be children of God on this journey. And as we move along on this journey, as we move forward in this pilgrimage, God's going to take us through strange lands that we're not familiar with. I remember whenever, uh, remember whenever we adopted Bertie from Ethiopia. And so we go to Ethiopia, and we're traveling through there, and we're seeing, you know, just everything's just so much different. The culture's different, the food's different, uh, the smells are different, the people are different. And we bring Bertie home. Now, Bertie, she didn't know English. She had no understanding of English. She only spoke Amharic. And there are several dialects of that, right? So whenever we brought her home, she had no concept of English whatsoever. So our plan was, whenever we bring her home, we're just going to immerse her in English. We're going to immerse her in American culture. We're going to give her the hot dogs. We're going to give her, you know, the chicken nuggets. We're going to just, play. all the TV shows are going to be in English. And so she's a little girl. She's going to pick up on all this, and this is how she's going to learn her language. Well, it worked. It worked. Until she remembered her parents. Until she remembered her family back in Ethiopia. Until something would come along, and it would it'd spark a memory. And then our little girl, who was adjusting really well, even today, a, a memory like that shocks her. It just it sort of, it, she kind of short circuits. Her, her temper flares up, her personality changes. She's, she's been wounded in her past, and she remembers home. She remembers those things that happened in her past. I want to challenge you that this same sort of thing can happen to us as we walk in this world. We are made for another place. We are made for heaven. We're made for God himself. And as we're walking through this world, as we walk past the people around us, and as we walk through the culture that is around us, we can begin to change. And as we're immersed in this culture, we learn the language of those people around us. We start saying the same things that they do. We start talking the way that they do. We start living the life that they do. And the thing that will shock us and shake us and bring us back out of it is to keep our eyes focused on the promises of God. If you keep your head in this book, if you keep your eyes peeled and watch the promises of God, if you trust Him Listen, it's about relying on God every single day. 
And as we rely on God every single day, we have to be reading this book. We have to be looking to the promises in order to understand where God's taking us and how he's unfolding things in our life. Mount Moriah, Mount Zion, and we still look to a mountain today, Mount Calvary. We look to Calvary. We look to what happened on that cross. We look to what Christ had done for us there, and it should shock us. It should shake us, and it should change everything around us. Can we sit there and watch the show or have the conversation that we're currently having with the coworker? Can we have that conversation and still be thinking about the cross? Can I live my life Monday through Saturday and be thinking about the cross and still be living the way that I'm living right now? That should challenge us. The promises of God are there to get us home, and that makes us look different in the land we're walking through. Where do we look now to remember the promises of God? Our trials are God's way of telling us He is our only resource. From where shall my help come? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. There is one God, one God alone, one source of strength, one power, one place that we can draw our strength from. And I and I was I was reading through, I was going through social media this weekend, and on Facebook there's a a video that popped up. And this video pops up, and it's a motivational speaker. Right, and so I pull this up, and I'm going to watch it for a little bit, and, and I really get, I get disinterested really quick in this video. So as I close it down, there's this whole string. Sometimes you do this. There's this whole string of videos that are supposed to be like it, right? So as you're watching this video, there's a ton of other videos that are like it underneath it and on top of it. So you go through and you start watching these things. And I'm seeing these motivational speakers. I'm seeing TED Talks. I'm seeing, uh, you know, Christopher Walken's giving movie quotes on it. Rocky Balboa is on there. You know, trying to motivate people through life. Just really giving them the ump that they need to get from point A to point B. And I realize as I'm watching this, that what I'm doing is I'm watching a group of people who are also on a journey. See, we have the Word of God, and we have Christ to look to, and we're moving from point A to point B, and we're moving towards God. But the world, the people that are out there, they don't have that promise. And so what they do, they take and they create their own promise. They take and they create their own purpose. They give their own destination, and then they come up with the strength and the ability to get there on their own. And so what they're doing is they're traveling in a very small circle, and they go over and over and over and over again until they die. They'll go towards the next big career move. If I I can get this next job, everything's going to be okay. If I can hit this certain income level, I'm going to be all right. If I can have this, uh, this person in my life, this relationship fixed, if I can have a better marriage, if I can do the X, Y, or Z, if I can do this thing, then everything's going to be okay. And I'm going to listen to Rocky Balboa quotes along the way in order to get me there, right? And so as they're moving from point A to point B, they get there. Lo and behold, they get there, and then what do they do? It's not enough. And because it's not enough, they need a promotion. And because it's not enough, they need just a little bit more money. And because it's not enough, they need just a little bit something else. Maybe a different spouse, because this one's not working out real well. Right? And they listen to more Rocky Balboa quotes to get them there. You and I have better promises. You and I have a better destination. You and I have a better hope and a better strength in order to get there. Right? As we look at... These people will look at us and say, God is a crutch. Have you heard that? They'll say, Christianity is a crutch. Christianity is a crutch for the people who just can't make it through life. No, no. No, listen. We are all born lame from the womb. Every single one of us. Sin has tore us up. It has separated us from God. It has distorted our hearts. It's distorted our minds. And it's distorted our purpose. And because it has, we are all lame coming out of the womb. We all need God. We all need a crutch. We're not made in order just to create our own purposes and create our own motivations and then to follow our own dreams. That's not what we're made for. We're made for God. We're made for Him. We're made to know Him, to love Him, and to walk in His presence, and to walk in His will, and to do His things. And because we're made for that, we have to lean on Him, because we can't accomplish it on our own. We're going from point A to point B, and we're leaning on God to help us get there. The wisdom of the world will never satisfy the longing of our hearts. Knowing God is our purpose and our promise for the road. God himself, God himself is our hope. This is Psalms 121, 3 through 4. He will not allow your foot to slip. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. 
it, whenever it says that he won't allow our foot to slip, I, I looked this up and, and, I, and I wanted to cover it really well in the Hebrew. And so the word here is mote, and I'm probably really mispronouncing that word. Whenever it says mote, it means shaken. It means being taken off course. It means that God will not allow your foot to stray from the course that he set in front of you. Now listen to this. This is really important. It's vital. You can lean on God, and he will keep you on course. But you turn away from him, you begin to choose the course. If you're not trusting in God to keep you, if you're not trusting in God to help you, if you're not trusting in God to protect you and to lead you from point A to point B, if you're not doing that, then your foot may slip. If you're trying to accomplish things on your own, you don't have the strength to get up the mountain. This is what the psalmist is talking about here. He's going up the mountain. He's going up towards Jerusalem. He's headed up that way. And he's worried. He looks around and he sees the jagged rocks. He sees the loose soil. He sees everything that's around him. And he doesn't want to misstep. If he missteps, he's going to fall off the path. You and I, we get so concerned by looking around us. If we're not leaning on and trusting on God, if we're not taking our problems to him and looking to him for help, then we will be so busy looking at the loose rocks and the soil that are around us as we're going towards the, problems of, uh, the promises of God that we will slip. We will be so nervous that we will slip. We will try, we will try and we will fail. And the reason is because is we're not trusting God in order to keep our feet. God will keep us on the path we need to go if we're leaning into him, if we're trusting him to do it. This is 1 Corinthians 10, 13. God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also so that you will be able to endure it. The promise does not belong to those who refuse to submit to God and obey His will. See, God was Israel's keeper. God promised. He said, I'm going to be faithful to you, Israel. In everything that you do, I'm going to remain faithful to you. And what happened? Israel was not faithful to God. And so God stood there and He would send His prophets and He would send His men out and they would say, turn to God. Rely on God. Obey His Word. Submit to Him again. Worship and love God. That's what His prophets would say. But they wouldn't. They turned from God, but God remained faithful. You see, you and I can fail. We can make a mistake, but it's God that remains faithful, standing there with His hands outstretched, saying, if you would turn and look to me again, regardless of how often you failed, regardless of where you failed, it doesn't matter the sin. It doesn't matter the, the mistake that you've made in your life. If you will just turn to me, I remain faithful. This is God's promise to us. You know, it's, whenever I preach, sometimes I feel like I'm asking for perfection from people because the Word of God talks so much about holiness. It talks so much about sanctification. It talks so much about growing into God. But listen, the real heart of a Christian is a heart that's willing to repent whenever they do make a mistake. It's a heart that says, I do need you, and I do want to draw closer to you. I do want to be near you, and you will keep me on this path so long as I do lean into you. He always makes a way of escape for us, regardless of the temptation that comes our way. If we, neg uh, excuse me, if we neglect our prayer time with God and our time in the Word, our time in fellowship with Him and with other believers, we're neglecting our walk. This is uh, Psalm 121, verses 5 through 8. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun will not smite you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will protect you from all evil. He will keep your soul. The Lord will guard your going out and your coming in from this time forth forever. I, I really, really like this picture, the shade on the right hand. There's, I wish I could just really go into depth about what all this means, what all is in this psalm, but this one picture really stood out to me. See, if you understand the kings that are in the Old Testament... And you understood uh, whenever they went out to battle, how they would form up their soldiers, right? They took their mightiest men, those men, the, the men of valor is what the Old Testament calls them. Those guys who you could really rely on, who were really strong, who you could really put your trust in. The king would take those guys and he would put them on the right-hand side. The right-hand side for a king was a place of honor. The right-hand side for a king was a place of strength. If you were put on the right-hand side of the king at the dinner table... You were in an important place. On the battlefield, if you were into the right-hand side of the king, you were important. You were strong. You were valiant. Whenever the Bible says that God is our shade on our right-hand side, what I want to draw to your attention is the fact that God, for this pilgrim who was in trouble, was in a place of honor. God was in a place in this man's life, in this pilgrim's life, where he said, I have honored you, and you are stronger than me. 
and you are bigger and better than I am, and here you are on my right-hand side, and here are my troubles in front of me, but you overshadow me. You cover me with your strength from that place of honor. Now for us, for you and I, if we don't take God and move Him in our lives to a place of honor, we're going to miss that covering. We're going to miss that protection. We're going to miss that, that promise of walking with us that He's given. It's a place of honor that God occupies. If we don't put Him in that place of honor, we're honoring ourselves. God stands on our right-hand side. He stands on the side that's shaded. He stands on the side that, that He deserves to be worshipped. He's not just our valiant warrior. He's our king. He's in command. He has that power and that authority. Whenever, whenever the psalmist says, I look up to the mountains. I look up to the mountains. Where does my help come from? It comes from the creator of heaven and earth. He sees strength there in God because God is the creator. God doesn't just help us along the path. He's made the path in front of us. And because he's made the path, he knows every stone, every turn, everything that's going to happen in our lives. He has seen it. And he's worked it all towards our good. He sees the mistakes you're going to make. And he sets up how you're going to be redeemed from those mistakes. He sees the successes in your life, and he set those up too. It's God who needs that place of honor in our life so that we can walk the path he's given us because he's made it. He's made our path. He's made our life. He's made the journey. Why can't we trust him with that? If he's made the path in front of us, we can surely trust him with tomorrow. If he's made the path in front of us, it doesn't matter what comes because the guy who actually spoke the road into existence is on our right-hand side in a place of honor, protecting and watching over us. He is the strong one. He's the valiant one, not us. And we need to arrive at a place where we're willing to say, yes, you are stronger. Yes, you are valiant. Yes, you do deserve the place of honor. This is my place. My place is over here. Your place, your place is here. It's in that throne that you have and, and putting that throne in your heart, putting Christ on it. You will either honor God with your life or you will honor your life without God. It's one of the two. You, are, you and I are not strong enough to survive a journey that we make for ourselves. We're not wise enough. We don't know all ends. We can't decide what's going to happen tomorrow. We don't get to make that decision. We can't even respond well to it. You think you have it all planned out. You have the right retirement fund, right? You have your money all back in savings, and you do these wise things that you should be doing. But you can't plan for the emergency that's going to happen 74 hours from now, right? You, you can't plan for that. You have no idea what's going to be happening three weeks from now. If we live a life where we're trusting in our own resources and our own abilities, it should frighten us. We don't have the strength in order to overcome them. And those motivational speakers that I was listening to earlier, they would tell you things like, you know, this is how you, this is how you get to this point. You know, empty your mind. You know, really just believe in yourself. Put the, put the feelers out there and make sure that you just really love yourself so much so that you can get past all, of your, all the bad things that's going to happen in your life. If you could just love yourself just a little bit more. Nobody hates themselves. Nobody. They can say they do. But nobody hates themselves. Right? We're all in love with us. We're all looking out for us. We're all trying to love us better, whether we say so or not. It's not that that gets us to the next point in our lives. It's not that that gets us through the valley. It's not our own strength. We look to God. It's loving God. It's loving the one who we were made for. It's loving the one who is the promise. It's loving the one who gives us the promise along the way to get us back to him, right? It's trusting him and looking towards home. It's trusting in the God who's promised to be with us. For those of you who lean on God, who know how desperate you are, God has given you the promise of himself. I want to encourage you to let your desperate situation be a blessing to you. Let it drive you into him. Lean on him. In every decision you make, every trouble you face, trust your creator to walk with you on the road he has made. Lean on God. Rely on God. Whatever distress you're going through, this is a blessing. This is a moment where you get to turn and you get to look at God and you get to say, less of me, more of you. Here it is. Here's, here's, here's God in this place of honor and here's my trial in front of me. Which one am I going to acknowledge? 
If I've given God that place of authority and honor in my life, will I acknowledge the enemy that's in front of me or will I acknowledge the Creator who overshadows me in my life? Which one am I going to look to? I can't look to myself. We always, we always look outside of ourselves. From where shall my help come from? We look to neighbors. We look to friends. We look to family. We look to addictions. We look to you know, anything that we can lean on that's going to take the hurt away for the next six hours. Whatever that thing is. We look to it and we don't look to God who should be overshadowing us as the creator of the road in front of us. Trust God in God and let whatever distress you're going through turn you back to him so that you can look more deeply into him so you can know him more deeply and watch as he picks you up in the middle of your distress and carries you one last thing before we close and I, I know so many of us we like the uh, like that poem the footprints poem if you've been in church any period of time you've seen this footprint poem where you know you see the two sets of footprints walking in the sand and then all of a sudden there's only one and you know, he's told, well, it's here where I've carried you, right? I want to encourage you even more than what that poem does. There's only ever one set of footprints in the sand for the child of God who truly trusts him. You and I can't go to Walmart without God's grace. <laughs> You've been to Walmart. You know you can't go to Walmart without God's grace. Without God's strength, without God's help, without God's pr uh, provision in our lives, we don't take our next breath. When we look to God and we trust in Him, He bears up all our burdens. It's not just that He's not going to put more on us than we can bear. That's nowhere in Scripture. He puts so much on us that only He is able to bear it. Whenever you have so much on your life that drives you to God, you have to look to somebody stronger than you. You can tell by this awesome physique that I used to lift weights a long time ago, right? So as I'm, I'm on the bench and I'm pushing the weights up and I'm doing this right here, it's just overwhelming. Just to, you know, I get to a point and my hands are stuck. This is really embarrassing for me and I'll go ahead and give the story because I'm sure you'll like this. I was in Iraq, surrounded by a bunch of soldiers and here I am and I'm working on the weights and this is not something that I did. I didn't work out on the weights. But I figured, you know what, I should do it here. You just get a little bit stronger. As I'm laying down on the bench, I'm pushing up. And I've done like three or four of these. And I'm a lot weaker than I thought I was. And my arms start to shake. And this massive guy, I was in the army, this Marine comes over, right? This Marine comes over and he picks this up, sets it back up on the bar for me. He said, would you like some help? I said, yeah, boy, I'd like some help. I don't know what I'm doing, right? That man was massive. Just a broad man, so strong. I'm laying down here and with his help, I can push. He'd spot me, and he'd say, push just a little bit harder. But I knew all along that guy that was just so huge was going to pick up that bar and just set it back down on there if I lost my grip, if I, if I was so weak. God overshadows us in that way. He doesn't put so much on you that you can't bear it. He puts more on you than you could possibly bear so that you get to see how strong he is. God is overshadowing you every single day. Let his strength pick up the weight. Let his strength do it. Don't look to yours. Don't, you were never made to trust yourself. You were never made to look to your own strength. That's not what you were made for. Look up to the hills. Look to the promises of God. Look to the one who's made those hills. Your every day was breathed into existence by a creator, and that God loves you and is waiting over the weight bench, ready to pick up whatever load you have in your hands that you won't give to him because you're just too tough. Let him have it. Let him have it. He wants it. He wants it because he loves you. If you would, bow your heads with me. I want to ask a couple of questions. I'm not going to keep you much longer at all. First, some of you today may be very comfortable in this world, in the land you're traveling through. You know we are called to look different than the world around us. We're strangers here. If you're not offended by the things out there in this life, you need to pray. If you justify your rudeness, anger, your unkindness towards others, and it doesn't convict you, then you need to pray. If you look more like this place than your promise, you need to pray and repent. The second, some of you may be tired. This world <clears throat> does have you down. You are discouraged by what you're facing. 
you needed to be reminded to look up to the hills and to think again of the promises of God. Some of you truly love your God. You don't feel like you can make it to your next promise. I want to encourage you. That promise has been walking beside you all along and he has never been absent. His grace has been working in your life in ways you may never know. But eternity will reveal just how far he has carried you. And I want to encourage you today. Be confident in your God. Not your strength, but his. And finally, some of you may be walking in the circles we talked about earlier. Going nowhere. Trusting in nothing. And just waiting to die. Start the journey you were made for. Repent of your sins and your wanderings. Believe in Christ's sacrifice and trust him fully and turn towards home. I'd love to pray with you. I'm going to be towards the back, back there. Pastor Chris, Pastor Colby, love to pray with you. I'm going to give you a moment here. I want you to meditate on the strength of God, on the goodness of God, and on his ability to take you towards his promises and get you home. the journey up the road to Jerusalem that he, uh, Casey started with. I just can't imagine what came across people as they were on this road, looking to these different hills and mountainsides, thinking, man, God did this to, to Abraham. He, man, this is where the transfiguration happened. This is where this happened, this happened. All these promises that, that were revealed along this road that they traveled, and then looking up to where Calvary was, and and to going up towards the temple, I can't imagine what it must have been like to see all of these mountains, these pillars, these reminders of what God has done for them. And in our life, we have that same thing. It may not look like a mountain. I enjoyed our Boston mountains out here. With the video we played earlier, I got to go out and I drove 80 miles around uh, the Devil's Den area to get in all these different shots of, the, of our beautiful mountainside here. Northwest Arkansas, but we have that. But, but what is so much more beautiful is the testimonies 
that we have in our hearts of the, the reminders, the mountains that God has done for us in our life. If we would just learn to remember to trust Him. Because you can look back to those testimonies and they strengthen you. If we just remember what He's done for us already, remember the, the mountains that He's already spoken to us on, we can get through whatever this life is has for us if we just trust him. Thank you, KC, for your message, and I hope today it encouraged you. Before we leave today, I get to the honor of doing something that's, that's so amazing. I, I get to dedicate a baby, and I'm really excited about that. And so I asked Heather and Hannah and Max and Daniel to step off of there for a minute. Uh, and also, if any of your family would like to come up as well, they're welcome to, to join you up here as well. But uh, I am excited about doing this. Uh, right here, up here is fine. I'm going to set that down. All right. Kara, would you join me up here as well? Hmm? I got it. Okay. So a lot of you may not know this is my wife, Kara. <laughs> She's always in the back working. We, uh, or with a baby, something, yeah. But anyway, hey, I'm excited about this um, this morning. Yeah, come on up. This is great. Yeah, let's, let's scoot over a little bit here. Let's scoot to the side. Make some more room. It's a big step. Yeah. All right. Max, you excited, buddy? Yeah, it's a big day. Well, this family joined us on Easter this year, and uh, Daniel's doing an incredible job. But what I admire most about them is uh, the conviction that they lead with. Um, they don't just do things because it's their job and it's because they're supposed to. They, do, they lead from a place of conviction. Uh, it's, every decision they make is just is, uh, thought through and it's meaningful and it's prayed over. and uh, They're just spirit-filled people that, that love God. And, and I think that that's going to make them great parents because I feel like they probably lead... Uh, from a place of conviction as well in the way they parent. So uh, I'm excited about this because uh, we're teaming with a great family here. And children are a gift from God. They're beautiful. We have our own little little girl, and, and while she may keep us up at night, they're, uh, they're just amazing gifts. And every little gummy smile that I get just lights my day up and makes me happy. And I'm sure that Hannah does the same for you all. But God is good as gives... Uh, children to us as gifts, and <laughs> we're making noises, that's okay. Not only uh, do we have the awesome responsibility of caring for this gift, but also the wonderful privilege of enjoying the gift, because children belong to God and are given as gifts to parents, it's appropriate that the children be dedicated back to God. This happens in the Bible. We are told in 1 Samuel chapter 1 that Hannah presented her son Samuel to, to the Lord. In Luke chapter 2, verse 22, we read that Mary and Joseph brought their baby Jesus to the temple in Jerusalem in order to present him before the Lord. In the same way, Daniel and Heather today bring their daughter Hannah, presenting themselves first to the Lord and then, and then Hannah. Daniel and Heather, I call your attention to the commands uh, of God recorded in Scripture. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5 through 7 says, And you must love the Lord with all of your heart, all of your soul, and all of your strength. And you must commit yourself wholeheartedly to these commands that I am giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you are at home and when you are on the road, when you are going to bed and when you're getting up. Basically saying all the time. <laughs> and the, the, your relationship with God and, and the way you carry that out in your life is something that, that should reflect in every moment of your life and it should affect every decision, every, everything that you do in your life. Your commitment to Christ should be one that runs throughout every moment in your life because when you commit your life to Christ, your children will see you and learn from you. Daniel and Heather, you come forward today to commit yourself to the responsibility of raising a godly woman. Now I ask you to enter the, the fallen commitment in the presence of God and his people so that Hannah may walk in the abundant life that Christ offers. Do you, Daniel and Heather, vow by God's help in partnership with this church to provide Hannah, she's, she's all about this, to provide Hannah a Christian home of love and peace to raise her in the truth of our Lord's instruction and discipline and to encourage her to one day trust Jesus Christ 
as, his sa- as her Savior and Lord. Yes. yes. Good, good decision. <laughs> Next, uh, I asked the church to make his vow as well. There's an old proverb that says it takes a village to raise a child, and, and we have definitely learned that as parents. That the more help, the better. Um, but parents have the first responsibility, but it's the parents, uh, but the parents need help and support of the community. So I direct my question now to the church. So that Hannah may walk in the abundant life that Christ offers, do you vow, by God's help, to be faithful in your calling as members of the body of Christ, to help Daniel and Heather be faithful to God, and to help teach and train Hannah in the ways of the Lord, so that she may one day trust her, uh, trust, trust him as Savior and Lord. Do you accept this responsibility? If you do, say, we do. We do. Good. Thank you. All right. Now, I'm going to pray over you guys, and I want to take Hannah. Can I take you? Come here. I know you're going to cry. You've never let me hold you before. But you're so happy to do it now. Yay. Uh-oh. You're doing so good. Let's go stand right next to Mama. There we go. See, we're right next to Mama. Yeah, she loves her Mama. Yeah, you love your Mama? Yeah. A little worried about this guy. <laughs> well, Hannah, you have great parents. You know that? You do. And you got a good little brother over there, too. He's looking at her like, I'm going to take care of her. <laughs> Max is a good, little, good big brother. There you go. Well, let's pray. Lord, we love you so much, Lord, and we thank you, Lord, for these precious gifts of, that you give us, Lord, these, these beautiful babies. We just pray, Lord, today as, as her parents, Daniel and Heather, uh, commit themselves to be parents that will raise her to follow you one day. That they're going to teach her right from wrong. They're going to teach her what it means to be godly parents. That they're going to teach her what it what, how to go through life. They're gonna, when, when they go through difficult times, she's going to look up and see them and how they handle it. When they go through great times, she's going to look to them and see how they handle it. And Lord, we pray that, that they would always have the strength to turn to you in times of need, in times of success, in times of, of success and greatness, Lord, that they would always turn to you no matter what they do. And Lord, we pray that for Hannah, that as she grows up, that she would, she would have the... the uh, the ability just to, to, to know that you are her, her Lord and Savior, the one that's going to take care of all of her boo-boos, all of her big problems, all of, all of her, uh, and be the one that, that deserves all the success in her life. We love you, Lord. Amen. 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 Really yeah, you did good. It's the first time you've successfully let me hold you. All right, we got you a couple of things to remember today. Uh, if I can find it here. Here's a certificate and a little Bible, so you can start reading now. <laughs> All right. Thank you, guys. Bye, Hannah. <laughs> Amen. Babies are awesome. I love me some babies. I don't want any more, but they're wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> They're wonderful. Hey, before I uh, go too much further, and we're going to close, we're, we're done. <laughs> but I do want to take up this, this morning's tithes and offering. Uh, I don't want to forget that. But uh, thank you so much for your faithful giving. Thank you for being part of our church. Uh, we could not, we cannot operate as a church without givers, without people uh, being generous and uh, tithing and giving their, their, their percentage back to, to God. And uh, today's been a great day. Baby dedications, great message. Uh, so many, so many wonderful moments. I, uh, worship was wonderful with all the, the theme of the mountains and everything. This is a great day. So as you go today, be encouraged to, to look to the mountains where your help comes from because, because the Lord is there and he's created those mountains and, and uh, they're beautiful. We love you, Lord. We thank you for today. We pray that as we leave the day, we leave encouraged and blessed and we'd be uh, encouraged to follow you more closely, Lord. We love you. Amen. Thank you for being here this morning.